developing, uh, let's go back part uh, point three, since we're having technical difficulties today. In keeping with the spirit of the gospel, developing human experience and dynamic Christian tradition, especially its two key insights of shared responsibility, corresponding freedom, and dialogue. The following basic principles shall say the governing structure and relationship of the church, and this is important. The principle of subsidiary shall rule through the church. That is, all decision-making rights and responsibilities shall remain with the smaller community unless the good of the, of the broader community specifically demands that it exercise those rights and responsibilities. <coughs> In other words, the local community will always have preference when it comes to decision making. And that's important. That's an orthodox standard to governance. And that's because, like with confession in the Orthodox Church, um, whether or not something is a sin, whether or not something is um, worthy of confession is left between you and your confessor. Because your confessor knows best your situation and circumstances. And that's important. That's very important to understand. And so we take that same model to apply to decision making within our dioceses, within our parishes. The local parish is going to know what's best for the local parish. And therefore, those decisions need to be made there, on that local level. Not here in North Augusta trying to make a decision for someone out in San Francisco doesn't work. My dynamic here, my situation here is vastly different than their situation out there. And only they know what's best for their parish. So it's their responsibility to make those decisions out there. Now, if they need help, they come to us and say, we don't have a clue what to do in this situation. Will you help us? The national offices, the international offices are here to help in that decision-making process. But it's not our responsibility to make those decisions. The ultimate decision has to be made by the parish, by the diocese, not by us. Unless, of course, it affects the international church, which we spoke about a moment ago. If a decision infects the international church, then that decision must be made on a higher level because the international church must be informed, kept abreast of it, and given the opportunity to weigh in. A uh, prime example of that would be right now uh, in Colombia, um, uh, our vicar there for the Diocese of Columbia has begun working on the year of Utrecht which is over this next year uh, end of 2013 into 2014 is the 125th anniversary of the Declaration of Utrecht and to celebrate that uh, he has asked for a church-wide Congress if you will uh, on the Diocese of, on the uh, Declaration of Utrecht and He's worked with my office closely in developing that, putting that together, and getting that out there, and that's important. So, he's been, um, you know, consulting us in the international church. And we will eventually release a, a, you know, international letter saying, this is what we're doing, this is when it starts, and all of that. So whenever it deals with something on a higher level than just the local community, always consult your diocesan bishop or the uh, international offices in order to make sure that they're given a chance to weigh in on things. <coughs> Beyond that, everything else is on the local level, day-to-day uh, -day operations of the church, day-to-day -day operations within um, interpersonal relationships and those kinds of things need to be dealt with on the local level. Um, throughout the church, the formulations and applications of the tradition shall be arrived at through a process of charitable and respectful dialogue. That's important 
too, because it says we're not going to do like uh, the Council of Nicaea where bishops got into fist fights. <laughs> we're going to we're going to maintain civility when we discuss issues of faith and tradition. Well, we're going to come together as a church and have that respectful dialogue whenever a question of, of faith, uh, a question of tradition comes up. And we pledge ourselves by agreeing to the canon law and constitution to maintain that, to be charitable and respectful. And that's important, especially in public forum, uh, on places like Facebook and MySpace and, and Google Plus and all these other social media sites. It's important to remain charitable and respectful in all of our dialogue. Uh, Throughout the church, each community shall form its own body of governing regulations. Each parish should have its own parish council, should develop its own uh, bylaws and constitutions that are in line, of course, with the national ones, but that govern the specific realities of uh, that parish there, um, rather than us trying to tell you how to do things from here. Um, and the same with the diocesan office. The diocesan offices should set up deaneries and that kind of thing to manage, um, you know, throughout the diocese to kind of help the bishop in keeping a pulse on how things are going and where help is needed and what the local churches are asking of the bishop. Um, the bishop then can keep in touch with people throughout the diocese, and the bishop should never neglect should never neglect an opportunity to sit down with the laity and talk. Be that at a confirmation, sitting down afterwards, or a reception, or just a regular Episcopal visit. As something that a lot of churches have gotten away from, their bishops come when, when needed. Our bishops need to take time just to go to visit. Just to say, hello, I'm here. Is there anything you want to talk about? Anything you, you need? I'm here. This is a time for you as a parish. Um, and not necessarily there just because somebody called and said, hey, uh, we need somebody to come over here and slap up some kids with some oil and make them confirm. No. We need to have open ability to go to those parishes and say, I'm here for you. What can I do to serve you? Uh, for those who someday will be bishops in the church, <coughs> because, um, you know, I never know who these uh, videos are going to be seen by. Uh, throughout the church, uh, um, leaders shall be elected to offices through appropriate structures giving voice to all respective constituents. And that's important. Um... We serve our communities, we serve our parishes, we serve our dioceses, we serve our offices um, at the pleasure of the people we serve. Um, even within um, each diocese. If a group of clergy believe that the uh, bishop is no longer effective or that he is um, not looking out for the best interests of the diocese, um, they can petition to remove him, to have someone else appointed in his place. And that's important to keep us on our toes. And the same for a parish. If a parish decides the priest is not who they want, they can remove him and have him replaced. Um, we would hope that through prayerful dialogue they would be able to come to an understanding. There are going to be cases where that's not true, where it's best for everyone involved if the priest moves on to another parish and someone new comes in. And that, we hope, um, will be smooth and, and easy. <coughs> Especially for the national offices as well. Uh, in the international offices, um, none of us who hold these offices as directors are here forever. We're here for uh, however long 
presiding bishop feels that we need to be. And if we become ineffective, our staff or the people served by us feel we're ineffective or that we've uh, outlived our usefulness, then the presiding bishop uh, will have no choice but to replace us. And that brings us to point E, which says, leaders shall hold a, spe a specified limited term with the exception of the presiding bishop. The presiding bishop is the only person in the church who has no term of office. Uh, all the rest of us have terms of office. Even bishops have terms of office. They don't realize it in a lot of ways, but um, because those times go by and the presiding bishop uh, hearing no um, issues from the, the clergy or laity in that diocese may extend this, the time period indefinitely. And uh, so a bishop may reign in a diocese for their entire life. Or they may reign there two years and the people say enough's enough. Um, our office, uh, the Office of Communications and Media Relations, uh, also has a specified term limit. Uh, when the people in my office are tired of me, when the people I serve say he's no longer doing a good job, they're going to kick me out. And they're going to put somebody else in my place and more power to them. Um, because that's the way it should work. From time to time, we have to cut off dead wood. As Jesus said uh, in the Gospels, you know, you have to prune the vine, you know, cut off the dead branches so that new fruit can be born. And that's going to have to happen from time to time. Uh, point F makes a good point, too, <coughs> that there should be a separation of legislative, executive, and judicial powers and a system of checks and balances shall be observed. And that's important, too. Um, it's a process that sometimes can cause uh, legislative backlog, as we've seen in our own American politics, or even international politics. <laughs> but it's also a procedure by which uh, the church can benefit greatly. Um, especially in judicial matters. We don't want um, people who legislate, you know, bishops and uh, parish councils and uh, uh, presiding bishops determining for a judicial committee whether or not someone has done something wrong or not. It's the judicial committee's decision to make. And that's important, especially in the light of scandals in the past by mainstream churches, that we allow those judicial committees and commissions to work un, unhindered, unburdened by micromanagement or by you know us looking over their shoulder, trying to tell them how to do things. No, they need to be able to minister. Uh, their justice as they see fit without all of that. Uh, the same is true of the executive and, and legislative. Um, you know, the legislative body of this church, of the IOCC, is the College of Bishops and Vicars. They ultimately make the decisions for the church. The presiding bishop, diocesan bishops, those of us in the various offices, follow what those decisions are and implement them and make them happen and make them work. But ultimately the legislative body, the, the College of Bishops and Vicars, they make the big decisions for the church. Now that's not to say every decision goes through them. Day-to-day uh, -day operations of the church as a whole pretty much um, are Decisions made by the various offices, made by the presiding bishop, made by diocesan bishops, made by parish priests. But um, big decisions are made by the College of Bishops and Vicars. Uh, yes, College of Bishops and Vicars. Sorry. I want to make sure I get my terminology just right. Okay, folks. <laughs> Uh, G says, all leaders and councils will regularly provide their constituents with account of their work, including financial accounts to be reviewed by an outside auditor uh, when appropriate. Uh, we have not been, um, we've not had an outside audit. 
um, yet. Those will be scheduled in the near future. Um, but all of those accountings are ready at any time for an outside auditor to review them. Um, now, as far as the work of our offices, that's released on a regular basis. Um, I personally, uh, for my office, the Office of, of Communication and Media Relations, about every three to four months release an update that says, this is what we're doing, this is what we're working on, this was completed. Uh, do you have any ideas, suggestions, needs, wants? Send them my way. Um, so it's important that that happen. Um, bishops, presiding bishop, um, and parish priest should at least, at a bare minimum, give a yearly accounting to their people. Uh, parish priests should give a yearly accounting to their parishioners. Um, bishops should give a yearly accounting to their priests and parishes. And the presiding bishop should give a yearly accounting for the entire church to the entire church. Uh, a state of the church address, if you were, as you were, um, uh, for the entire church to see and know what's going on. And all groupings of the faithful, now this is H, all groupings of the faithful, including women and minorities, shall be equally represented in all positions of leadership and decision making. And we try to enforce this as, as much as we can. Uh, we don't get as many um, female or minority applicants, although we have a, a large minority uh, uh, contingents uh, within the uh, church. Um, we don't get a lot of applicants who are minorities. We don't get a lot of applicants uh, who are women, and that's that's something that we're looking at. And how can we draw in more minorities and applic uh, women applicants? Uh, uh, toward the priesthood and the religious life. I mean, I think that's very important uh, within the church. Uh, we do have uh, several female deacons. We have um, one, uh, let's see, one, two, three, <laughs> three female priests right off the top of my head, um, and a female bishop. Uh, now, that's not proportionate with the rest of the church, I know, but it's getting there. It's a step in the right direction, and it will eventually get there entirely. Um, but um, it's going to take some time. Um, so, and then uh, we want them to be represented both in leadership and the decision-making process of the church. Um, as we go along, and that's very important. Um, we're going to stop here for now. This is about 30 minutes worth of videos uh, so far. We're going to go into uh, the next set of videos. We'll go into uh, Section C, Councils, um, and we'll uh, discuss that on the various uh, sections and hopefully get through uh, Section D on Leaders as well. Uh, we'll move through those a little quicker, I think, in this first step because we need to set the, the foundation for this. So, um, but this will be uh, video one and two of um, you know section A of section three, and uh, we'll look at uh, some of the other things in the next few videos. Thank you. God bless.